Hello, everybody, and welcome to everybody joining us today for our event, Bert the Beetle Doesn't Bite, with author and illustrator Ashley Spires. Uh, my name is Dominique Patnick, and I am joining you from the Royal Canadian uh, Geographical Society and Canadian Geographic Education, and we offer free bilingual resources to support geography education across Canada. We're running this event in partnership with Kids Can Press, a Canadian-owned children's book publisher, home of wonderful brands like Scaredy Squirrel and Franklin the Turtle. I just wanted to say thank you so much, all um, teachers and students, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. So we're going to get a chance to take a sneak peek into Ashley's upcoming book, Bert the Beetle Doesn't Bite, which comes out June 1st. In it, she explores different insect superpowers, including uncovering which superpower Bert the Beetle has. We'll also have time for questions after. So teachers, if you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook, make sure to pop your questions in the chat. And we'll also visit the classes that are joining us directly too. And then at the very end, Ashley is going to show us how to draw one of her characters. So be sure to have a pencil and a piece of paper ready. So now the reason that we're here today is Ashley Spires and I'd like to introduce her. She is the uh, an author and an illustrator who's created many wonderful characters that you may know like Small Saul, Larf and Binky the Space Cat. You might also recognize her name from one of her books, uh, her best one of her best selling books called The Most Magnificent Thing, which has been translated into 19 languages and adapted into a short animated film as well. With her books, she tries to show that by making mistakes, you can learn from those mistakes. And that's a very important lesson for people of all ages to learn. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Ashley Spires. I'm just gonna bring you in, just give me one second, Ashley. Hello, welcome. Hello, everybody. And I see we, we, we have a visitor joining us as well. I I have a little friend here with me as well because she just was so excited about the book she had to show up. So this is Penny and she will just hang out for a second and then she'll probably move on. But this is better than her screaming at me during our presentation. The joys of COVID learning. <laughs> yes, yeah. well, the, the, the floor is yours, Ashley. Okay, thank you very much. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in our great big country. I'm so excited that you guys are here today to talk with me about Bert the Beetle. So I'm really excited. I'm going to show you guys a whole bunch of stuff about where the book came from. I'm going to give you a sneak peek and read to you a little bit of the story. And I'm also going to show you how hard it is to make a book. And after I do all that stuff, I'm going to answer all your questions and I can't wait. So I hope you guys have loads and loads of questions because I'm excited to do that. So I'm going to share with you guys my screen right now, which is going to show you my presentation. So I'm going to get that going. So there's me and that might give you a little bit of a hint that drawing there of me, how many little friends I have in my house besides Penny, who's with me here. So some of you guys might know my work. So I'm an author and an illustrator, and that means that I get to write stories and I get to draw pictures. So it's kind of the best job in the whole wide world, in my opinion. And you, some of you guys might know my stories. Um, I sort of mentioned some of them before. Uh, some of my stories, I have to get inspiration from all different places. So ones like this come from my own experiences, my own feelings. I have some books that are inspired by the pets in my life, like the one sitting on my lap right now. I have books that are all about something I drew that was kind of fun one day. Small Saul and Larf both were just because drawing pirates and drawing Sasquatches are really fun. And so I built stories around them. And I even get inspired by science. And so while I'm not a scientist by any means, I love the idea of, of all the things that science can teach us. And so I even make books about that. And so I am always looking around me at the world to get inspiration for my next story. And you might have probably noticed by the cat that's sitting on my lap, I'm a big animal person. So I have a lot of cats in my house right now. These are the five that I live with permanently, but I also uh, foster kittens for my local shelter. And so I, I work with animals an awful lot and they of course inspire me all the time. And I all, don't just have cats, I also have this beautiful fella right here, Gordon the dog. And as you guys know, if any of you guys have a pet, when you have a dog, you gotta go for walks, right? And one of the great things about going for walks is that you get to explore the world around you. 
I live in a beautiful little corner of British Columbia where there are all different types of animals. When Gordon and I go for walks, we see beavers and we see eagles and we see frogs and snakes and turtles, all kinds of cool stuff. And of course, we see bugs because bugs are absolutely everywhere. And there's this particular bug that I have always absolutely loved. This is a June bug. And what I didn't realize is that this is a very specific June bug to British Columbia. It's actually called a 10 line June beetle. And as you can see from my finger there, he's a pretty big fella. Yeah, and I have always been sort of fascinated by them, even though I there are a lot of bugs that I'm not super down with, like, you know, the creepy crawlers, but this guy I've always really enjoyed. And I was looking at these guys and I thought, you know, I should make a book about these guys. And you know what's really cool, as we all know, is that bugs have really cool abilities, right? We know ants are super strong, and we know that uh, bees are just oh, so incredible, their ability to go out anywhere and find pollen, find their way home. And then I started thinking, well, June bugs must do something kind of cool too. So I started, I came home and I started to do some research. And I was like, well, um, are, is, are they really fast? So who is the fastest insect? And then I looked that up and it turned out that actually the Australian tiger beetle is the last, the fastest land insect. They run five miles an hour. And the dragonfly is actually the fastest flying insect. They go 58 kilometers an hour through the air, which is pretty incredible. But not a June bug. June bug, not the fastest. And, and then I wonder, okay, well, maybe he's super strong. So who's the strongest insect? And I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe ants. But actually, it isn't an ant that's the strongest insect. The strongest insect is the horned dung beetle. They can pull. 1,141 times their weight. That would be like you pulling two 18-wheel semi-trucks down the road behind you. Wow. But as you can see, not the June bug. And then I thought, well, maybe he's a pretty big guy, right? You saw in the video, maybe he's just the biggest insect. And so I looked up who is the largest insect, and it turns out it's not a June bug. It's a Goliath beetle. And they grow up to almost they're over four inches long, the males do anyway. So great big bucks, but again, not the June bug. And so I was doing all this research and I was discovering all these cool things. The ironclad beetle is totally indestructible. There's a termite that can spew boiling hot poison out of its butt. And there's a moth that can blast its predators with ultrasonic waves that confuses them so they don't know where they're going. And so there's all these bugs that are kind of superheroes. And I was like, well, this is really cool. I definitely want to write this book now, but I still want to write about a June bug. So I looked and I looked and I looked and I was like, well, there's got to be something cool about June bugs. They must do something really impressive. And it turns out they don't. Yeah, I know, Bert. It's kind of an oh crumbs moment. So there's not really much that a June bug can do that makes him like the best. And then I realized that, you know what? I get that. I kind of have a lot of days where I don't feel like I'm the best. I was always picked last in dodgeball. I wasn't necessarily the best at math or science. There were lots of things that I wasn't the best at. And I thought maybe, maybe that's what I should write about. Write about those of us that maybe aren't the best at stuff, but we do have a great attitude. And so that's where the story Bert the Beetle came from. So now that I've told you where the idea came from, I'm now going to read you some of Bert the Beetle. I'm not able to read you the whole book because it's it's kind of a longer book. So hopefully you guys will have a chance to see the ending later. But let me introduce you to Bert the Beetle, who, don't worry, doesn't bite. Every backyard is home to thousands of insect species. Whoa, that's amazing, says Bert. Some fly. Bzzz, says the mosquito. I'm the fastest flying insect, says the dragonfly. And the butterfly responds, and the braggiest. And some crawl? The stick bug's saying, look at those pincers. And the weevil's going, yike. And the earwig says, please don't look at my bum. And Bert says, by the way, I can fly and crawl. This is a 10 line June beetle. My friends call me Bert also known as a watermelon beetle. Yeah, I don't see the resemblance. That's Bert and that's an actual watermelon. I think there's a pretty strong resemblance. June beetles have feathery antenna. It's a style choice. A furry belly, all natural. 
and can grow up to two inches long. Don't worry, I may be big, but I don't bite. I'm more of a hugger. Bring it in. Yeah, no thanks. Some bugs have superpower-like abilities. Whoa, seriously? Do I have a superpower? Ants can carry 50 times their weight. Zowie, do you work out? Hawk moths shoot ultrasonic blasts. I don't know where I'm going, says the bat. Someone get that bat a map. Some termites can spray paralyzing venom. I can't move. Great aim, says Bert. You must always win at freeze tag. And I don't even have eyes, says the termite. Stink bugs release a bad smell to repel predators. Wow, super gross, but also super cool. And June beetles <gasps> can't do any of those things. Hmm. But I can do other stuff, says Bert. I can hat my pig and rip tub my rummy. Wait, that's not right. I can wink my right eye. Blink. Did I do it? And like all self-respecting June beetles, I can tap dance. A five, six, seven, eight. Uh-oh, thud. June beetles do not have any special abilities. Hold on, there must be something special about us. June beetles are usually found chasing porch lights. You are the light of my life, says Bert or flailing their legs in the air. A um, little help? <sighs> well, I'm different. I bet I have some hidden talents even the scientists don't know about. And besides, I can do lots of things other bugs can do. Most bugs can climb up walls. No problem, says Bert. Up I go. Is this right? Uh, this this doesn't feel right. Blonk. Ugh, little help. A lot of bugs can ride, run fast. I feel the need for speed, says Bert. On your mark, get set, go! Are you timing this? I feel like I'm breaking some records. Oh no, slippy slime! Oh, I should have stretched first. Some bugs have defenses against predators. All right, no more Mr. Nicebug. Feel my thunder. Chirp, <sighs> little help. Many bugs can fly. Let's see what these four wings can do. Are you watching? Bombs away, ah! Whoosh! See, I can fly! I own the sky! Hey, whoa, how do you steer this thing? Crash! Ugh, oh, I'm stuck. It happens sometimes. Oh, hey, is having sticky legs a superpower? So that's where I'm going to stop it. And you guys are going to have to hopefully get a chance to read it and find out if having sticky legs is, in fact, a superpower. And that is a true story because when I've had many a June bug come into the house and when I try to take them out of the house, they stick to the carpet and it becomes this whole big battle between us where I'm just trying to help them, but they don't quite get it. So that's Bert the Beetle the way it looks now as it's published. But some people don't know how long it takes to make a book. Now, I actually came up with the story for Bert the Beetle, or as he was originally called, Alistair Junebug, about five or six years ago. Can you believe it? Years ago, I had this idea. And I did know that I wanted to have him existing in a world of superheroes and superbugs. And so it originally was called Alistair Superbug and uh, the Caterbot, which was a caterpillar slash robot. And so I had this whole idea of this world that he existed in with everyone else had superpowers and he just didn't seem to have it. And so when I have a story idea, I write it. And it doesn't look terribly exciting. It looks like this. 
But originally, Bert the Beetle was going to be a picture book. So a little bit more like The Most Magnificent Thing and Small Saul that you may have read. So less of a, of a comic and more like big pictures with fewer words. And I showed this to somebody called an editor. Now, she is an extraordinary person that I work with very closely. And she's kind of like your teacher is to you guys. She reads my work and she helps me make it better. And she often has really great ideas. And in this case, she said, what if Junebug was a comic book? And I said, oh, well, yes, let's do a comic book because I love drawing comics. And so I then got to make the story just a little bit bigger. And I had this whole story, again, about this June bug who just wasn't very good at stuff and he was always looking at all the other bugs and all the cool stuff they did and then I thought oh she looked at it and said yeah it's good but maybe um, maybe make it a little bit bigger and so I actually had this whole other story where they're all the bugs that have superpowers were called the protectors and they were protecting everybody in the backyard and Alistair just really wanted to be one of those bugs and so um, the story got bigger and then the story got even bigger and then it was too big and we were like, this is getting too confusing. This is going to be a 200 page graphic novel for like middle grade at the rate I'm going. So we had to just bring it back again. But I didn't quite know how to bring it back again. And so I was really stuck and I didn't know how to make the story just right. And I didn't know what to do with the plot of the story. But I knew who Bert was. I knew his character. And so I know this sounds really strange, but what I actually did was I sat down and imagined that Bert was sitting at the table with me. And I said, Bert, I really want to make this story about you. And he, and he said, oh, that's amazing. I would love to be in a, in a book. I said, I know. I, everyone's going to love to read about you. And so I have this idea where all the other bugs have superpowers. And he was like, oh, do I have superpowers? And I said, you know what, Bert, you know, you, you don't. I'm sorry. And he's like, well, that's, that's okay. Maybe I could just try. Maybe, we don't know. And I said, yeah, I know we don't know. But, you know, it, you don't really have super strength or anything. He said, but I, I could try. And we had this whole conversation and I realized that that was the story. The story was Bert trying to convince the narrator that he was a super powered bug. And it's amazing how sometimes talking to yourself <laughs> can help you discover a story. So after writing the book, oh boy, I don't even know. I showed you, I think, uh, five different drafts there, but I, I definitely wrote more than that because there are some that are un incomplete in my in my save files. So I wrote the story probably at least uh, 12 to 20 times. And then I know it seems like, okay, well now you've got the story, you just sit down and, and draw the book. Well, I needed to figure out what Bert was gonna look like. Cause if you'll remember from the couple slides ago, um, I, you know, he looked very different back then. So it takes me a long time to figure out what my character is gonna look like. And the only way to figure out how something's gonna look is to try over and over and over again. And so I make a lot of mistakes and I try all different shapes and I tried all different ways to make his eye shapes, to make his body shape, to make his little feathery antenna. I even colored him in different ways, which you can see right here. I tried all different types of things, but it turned out that we really liked number four right here, which was great. So I thought, okay, well, he looks really cute there, but let's see what he's going to look like in color. And then this was the very first time I ever drew Bert looking the way he does, even though I added the feather, he was more feathery when it was, when it was done. So now we know the story. Now we've got figured out what Bert's going to look like. Again, all I have to do is sit down and draw the whole thing, right? Well, it still takes a lot of time to get it, a book just right before it's published. So what I do is I draw the whole book like this on my computer, which you can kind of see next to me and which I'll be drawing on in just a moment when we draw together. And so I draw the whole book with just sketches because very often, especially with a 56 page book, there's gonna be stuff that I'm gonna to wanna to change. So I draw the whole thing without coloring it because as you guys know, coloring takes a lot of time, right? So I draw it all in a sketch like this, the whole book, and I share it with my editor and with my extraordinary book designer. And we look at every page and we make sure that the story's making shit sense. We're making sure that Bert's expressions are just right. And we go through the whole book with a fine tooth comb to get it just right. And then only once the whole book looks just as it's going to, do I get to do the fun part and start to add the color. So I always start by inking the whole thing like this, which is just by putting the black line in. And then I color Bert in first because he's the most important. And I throw a little bit of the, the ground in and then I add the background. 
And so there are, like I said, 56 pages like that that require all those steps in in Bert the Beetle. So actually Bert, besides the fact that I got the idea five or six years ago to actually make the book, I think it took us um, about six months. Maybe it was a little bit less on this one actually because uh, it was the only book that I've done so well, yeah, that I've started and finished during quarantine. And uh, so it was, everything else got really quiet. So it was easy to just sort of plow through this book. <laughs> so I know um, you're probably wondering what the spider's wondering and, um, you know, is this ever going to end? Is she ever going to stop talking? And I uh, guess you're stuck with me a little bit longer, but I would love to answer any questions that you guys might have right now. So I'm going to end my slideshow so that I can see you and hopefully some of you guys have some questions for me and um, I would love to answer anything that you might have. Wow, that was such a wonderful presentation, Ashley. Thank you so much. Um, I really did not know a lot about um, about about insects, but but before you before hearing you speak, so thank you so much uh, for for that. Um, for teachers who are watching us over YouTube and Facebook, please feel free to post your, your uh, questions or your students' questions in the chat. We'll also be visiting each of our classrooms that are joining us directly. Um, I will start with some, uh, some, some YouTube questions. And I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one, Ashley, but, but we, we can try. Right. I'm wondering if, um, how, how insects can see. Did you, in, uh, when you came across your research, did you ever come across any really interesting, um, sight, sight uh, in insects who can see differently than, than others? Well, definitely the housefly seems to have the best vision. And actually, if you guys ever get a chance to check out Bird the Beetle, um, I have these little playing cards sort of at the beginning and they're, they show all these other superpowers. So as you can see here, super sight, let me line it up here. Super sight down at the bottom here is the housefly. So um, I think it depends on which insect because they all have very different vision. And, and like I mentioned in, in the book there, there's a particular termite that doesn't even have eyes. So sight doesn't even enter into it. Um, so I, I only know a little bit about that. And what I know is just what I learned on the internet. Um, but, but it looks like housewives have the best vision because they have so many eyeballs. And then of course, with things like the termite, they use other senses to see for them, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's there's a whole host of insects out there with with all different types of superpowers. We could make tons of books uh, about it all. And hopefully, uh, we'll another one. <laughs> yes, yes. I'll, I'll take another one from YouTube before we we visit our classrooms. Um, I have here a student that is wondering. Oh, this is a great one. It's it's based on your writing. Are all of your books based on your own experiences? Ooh. Um. Well, to some extent, I think there's a little bit of me in all of my books. So with The Most Magnificent Thing uh, is very much definitely the most about my own experience because it's about a character who tries and tries and tries and gets through things wrong a lot. And as you saw in the process of making a book, that's just kind of how books get made. you got to do a bunch of mistakes and you have to try and try and try until it gets until it's just right. So that's a very personal one. But I think there's a little bit of me in everything. Small Saul is definitely me uh, to some extent where I was always just I knew I knew what I wanted to do. And sorry if I didn't fit in with anybody else, but I'm going to go and do my thing. And Larf, who likes to live alone with his with his animals, just like I do. And uh, and Binky the Space Cat. Well, I don't try and protect the world for, from aliens, but I do have cats that are like that. And and Bert, I think I think his personality is I think there's a little bit of me in there. I love that. Like, OK, so maybe I'm not the best at everything, but I can be a really great friend and I can support other people. So I think there's a little bit of me in every in every one of my books. And hopefully um, that's why they connect with people, because I think the best writing comes from an authentic place and, and a little bit of who you really are. Like I completely agree. I think when, especially when, when we can all kind of connect with those books as well, it really helps us all to connect with the with the author as well, which is which is really cool. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to visit our classrooms that are joining us directly, our teachers that are joining us directly now to see um, if you have any questions. So, Miss Kind, I'm going to start with you. So I'll just add you here, and um, if if you have a a question for for Ashley. Good morning. Uh, we're so excited for this opportunity today. Our question is, is when did you know you wanted to be an author? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, 
kind of late in life, to be honest. So I was, I was absolutely one of those kids who was always drawing, who was always creating, always making things. And so I knew I wanted to do something to do with art. So I actually went to art school here in Vancouver. I went to Emily Carr, but it wasn't until my third year of university. So I was maybe 20 and I took a course with my teacher who was an author and an illustrator and the course was a bookmaking course. So I was actually making books and it was like, fireworks. I knew exactly that this is where I wanted to spend the rest of my life. At the end of the semester, um, everybody came in with, you know, the one book that they had spent all this time making. And I walked in with a box of 20, not even an exaggeration. I had stories just pouring out of me and I got to draw all my funny little doodles. And it was just, it was exactly where I wanted to be. So I, I took me a while to figure out that I wanted to do that. I wasn't a little kid thinking I, I wanted to make books, but when I was a kid, I did think I wanted to, um, be an animator. So I guess there was always a part of me that always knew that I wanted to tell stories through pictures. It just took me a while to land in, in this industry and this career in particular. Yeah. That was a good question. Thanks though. It was, it was a very good question. And I, I, I think, um, a lot of kids are, are probably thinking kind of the, the same thing, like, how do you even get into a job like this? How do you know if you want to get into a job like this? So it's it's very cool, the the, the path that you've taken and the, the, the amazing books that you do as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I always say just make stuff. If you're creative and you like making things, just keep making things and opportunities will find you. Yes, yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, I am going to go to, who do we have next here? Oh, Miss Hinder, I will, bring you up next to see if you or any of your students have any questions and you'll just need to um, reactivate your microphone again. Hi, we are joining you. Uh, it's going to be me that's sharing the question on our behalf. And I know that I can speak from our great students and you said that you're inspired by the world around you and we use the word nature a lot. So we're inspired by the world around us and uh, we're actually in the middle of becoming bookmakers ourselves. So we're authors and illustrators and I'm so excited to go back and chat with my students. But uh, our question to you would be, um, what would be your advice for us as uh, beginning bookmakers? So we are authors and illustrators. Um, so what, what do you have to share for us? Um, well, I guess it depends on, on which which aspect of, uh, of creating you are. Some people sit down and they have so many ideas they don't know which one to pick. And so I would say if you're one of those, those creators, then just start writing and you'll just find that there's something there that you're gonna wanna play with and, and try to just um, tr try and create a character if you can, because I think so much of, of great storytelling has to start with a good character. So if you have a ton of ideas, Pick the character you like the most and maybe run with that one. Now, if you're one of the people who sits down and is like, oh, I, got, I was told I have to write a story and I don't really have an idea, ask a friend. Walk, go for a walk. Ask your friend. Uh, something I like to say is, is if you have a friend nearby and say, what did you do this morning? And even if it's just they told you they had oatmeal, make a story about oatmeal. Were there bugs in the oatmeal? Was the oatmeal once alive? Does the oatmeal actually give them superpowers when they ate it? There's all kinds of things that you can do from something really, really simple. And so I think sometimes it's kind of intimidating to think you're gonna sit down and write a story or draw the whole book. Remember that all story has to start with a little tiny germ of an idea. So don't worry about what the book's gonna look like at the end. Just start with something that you get kind of excited about, whether it's drawing a character, creating a world, something like that, it's just to start somewhere and you're gonna be amazed at what your imagination is going to do with that little tiny idea. So I think that's that's what I would suggest. I, I love that, that that idea. It reminds me of that, that saying like a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very true. You can really start with just kind of a little small, uh, small idea and really develop it into something, you know, absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Um, so th thank you so much. Um, Miss Hinder for that wonderful question from your students. We will visit the uh, Miss Livingston now to see if you or your students have any questions. You can just reactivate your microphone. Perfect. Hello, um, I'm joining you from our empty classroom today in Calgary. My kindergarten students are all tuning in from home today. And 
before we, when we were in person, we collected some questions. So I think you've touched on a couple of these things, but maybe you could revisit them for my students. Their questions were, how do ideas get from your head inside to, of a book? And um, do you ever get stuck on an idea? And what do you do? Do I ever get stuck on an idea? Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, how do so we'll start with the first part of that question? So, where how do ideas get from here into here? Well, a bunch of different ways. So, I have a number of things at my fingertips all the time. I have a notebook. I have actually about five different notebooks because they're all kind of all over the house. And anytime I have a teeny tiny little idea, I write it down. And even, like, again, that's what I was sort of saying before. Like any little germ of an idea, I write it down. And I don't worry about my spelling. I don't worry about whether or not it makes sense to anybody but me. I'm just getting the ideas out. And I start writing them in on the page. And now that I've got them written, then I can start to go, oh, okay. So I can start to sort of fill it in a little bit. And when I sit down and maybe write, write a few more pages. And so I just kind of let it keep getting bigger and bigger. That's one of the ways that I get my ideas. But because I love drawing so much and drawing is my favorite, I also get ideas in my sketchbook. So the thing that I absolutely love about sketchbooks and those of you who are getting used to the world of writing and printing and all that kind of stuff, most of us start by drawing first, right? And so I think a great place to start if you wanna work on your ideas is in your sketchbook. And the great thing about sketchbooks is that you get to draw whatever you want and you get to play around, sorry, everything's the opposite when I'm looking at it on the screen. You get to play around and doodle and do whatever you want. And sometimes a doodle will come out of your face or out of your brain into onto the page and then it might turn into something. So this is one of the first times I drew my little fairy scientist that I mentioned at the beginning. So doodles will often be a place for me to start. And then in terms of like how it actually turns into a book, well, a lot of hard work as I showed you and also an extraordinary publisher. So I work with Kids Can Press for these books. I work with a number of different publishers, but Kids Can has been so great for me. And so what they do is they make loads and loads and loads of copies of the thing that I created and they print off lots and lots of copies. And that's what you guys get to go to the bookstore and read and read or go to the library or find in your classroom. And so I don't have to make every single book whew, because I would not have time to talk to you guys today if I did, but I do get to draw all the pictures and create all the ideas. And again, those usually start in a notebook or a sketchbook for me. I imagine it's, it's always important to, to have one with you, eh? Just in case you, you get mm -hmm. an idea. Even uh, I use the notes in here a lot. Uh, there's a lot of dog walks that I go on where I'm just like, idea into my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I will we'll, we'll take the questions are flowing in um, thank you everybody so much for your questions we will try to get to as many as possible um, I do have one here Sophia is wondering how many June beetles you found in your neighborhood and are they around all year long good question they are not they're June beetles so they really are kind of here in June but just like everything, they're kind of not even good at showing up on time. So they're very often around in July. <laughs> so there are often quite a few and they come out at night. So when I go on my evening walks with Gordon, we see a lot of them. So I can usually find at least two to three a night, um, they, but they don't stick around for very long. I think they actually grow underground. So they're grubs for like three years in the ground and then they hatch and are like a full grown beetle for only a few months. Uh, yeah, I think that's how that works. I, I feel like I'm going to look at, at June bugs in a, in a whole new light now. <laughs> it's really cool. They're very fascinating, yeah. Um, another one is, do you have a least favorite insect? Oh, many. <laughs> and I'm sticking strictly with, with insects. I won't get into like spiders and ticks because arachnids and I, we are we are at war and will be forever. Not a fan. Um, I, I don't like earwigs. I Definitely not an earwig person with their little pincies. I do not like those. Obviously wasps because they hurt, they sting the most. Um, and no seams, which right now we have, They're, they've just hatched, I've noticed, and they come in the screens and they'll bite me while I'm working at night and, and they can't see them. That's why they're no seam. So those are probably my least favorite ones. Yeah. To say nothing of fleas and lice. <laughs> 
yes, there's there, there's a whole uh, a whole range of, of insects, eh? Uh, of insects out there. They, yeah. they they all have their place, but that doesn't mean that we always have to love them all. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another question here. Um, wondering, somebody wondering what's the uh, favorite character from one of your books? Ooh. Like my favorite character of my books? Um, yeah. You know, it's kind of, you know, when, um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever asked your parents, who's your favorite kid? <laughs> it's kind of the same kind of question for me where they're all, they're all kind of my babies. And so there's a little bit of me in all of them. Um, I, I actually, I do really love Bert. I think one of the reasons that I really love him is because he is such a positive, loving, happy guy. And again, I was working on this right at the beginning of COVID last year, and I couldn't have thought of a better character to spend my time with. He lifted my spirit and my soul up just getting to spend time with him. So he is definitely one of my favorites. I just, I, he's very formed and very, um, very positive in my head. But I do, I do love all my characters. Obviously Binky is, I, I love him and will love him forever. And, um, and the girl from the most magnificent thing, a little bit of everybody. Yeah. It, it must be really hard to pick because you've you've put so much of yourself into into all of them as well. So I, I imagine it can be hard to pick a favorite. You yeah. maybe maybe your favorites at di different times depending on what's going on. Exactly, that's exactly it. Yes. <laughs> um. So we we do have many more questions. I'm I'm so sorry we won't have a chance to get to them all because. Ashley is going to get is going to show us she's going to make artists out of us all she's going to show us how to draw a character so mm -hmm. we're very lucky for um to to be able to get this experience to be shown how to draw a character from from an from an illustrator and an author so um Ashley you can feel free to to share your screen if you like and um so uh, first I'll just introduce we're gonna we're gonna draw Bert today together <gasps> excellent and I know it might seem a little intimidating but I'm gonna do this slowly step by step and you guys can can hopefully follow along. And I, as I, I understand, it's being recorded. So if you if I go too fast for whatever reason, then um, you can watch it again and and exactly and follow along. And now um, I'm going to oops, sorry. No, no, that that's no problem. This will give everybody a chance to um, to grab their pencil and their piece of paper. Perfect. Um, there we go. So I've got my screen up. Great. And um, and also, if if this goes really quickly too, and we have time for more questions, I'd be happy to do that. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ashley. So um, um, we see it now. Perfect. There we go. You're all set. All right. So you can see this is my pencil that's on that's on there. So this is the joy of drawing on the computer. Now, Bert the Beetle, he always starts as kind of an egg with a flat top, like that. And that's, you know what, that's actually kind of how Binky starts too, which is really kind of funny. A lot of my characters start with this kind of round shape. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add a little line. So let's say he is three different. I'm going to just do something really quick here um, just to give you an idea of what I'm doing here. So let's say he's cut into three like that. So what we're going to do is we are going to draw a line that sort of shows where his body is. So this is again the joy of um, the computer is I can just get rid of those lines. <laughs> so we've got, this is sort of where his head's gonna be, but we're going to add in the lines that make his body, his abdomen, as part of his exoskeleton there. And we're going to also add in just a little bit of an extra sort of circle-y kind of thing on both sides. And what that is, that's his shell. That's his wings that he has folded in. We just like to see them a little bit. Now we're going to add in his feathery antenna. So those are just these kind of squiggles that come out from either side of his head, kind of like where ears would be. And now they're nice and feathery. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add lots of little lines in here. Just like that. I'm just going to take a small pause to make sure everybody's able to catch up. And now we got to give him his happy little face, right? So we are going to do two big circles. So we're going to have one big circle here and then another big circle here. Those are his great big eyes. They take up most of his head. Yeah. And then I'm going to have him 
have big dots right in the middle of his eye. He's going to be looking right at you because that's Bert. He's always talking right to you. And I'm going to cheat because this is what I can do on the computer, and I'm going to move this eye down just the tiniest bit because I'm an illustrator, and this is what we do. We nitpick our drawings. <laughs> but if you have an eraser, please feel free to erase. Now, he's happy, so we're going to give him a little happy smile. In fact, I might even have his mouth open a little bit. Just like that. And color it in a little. Oh, and we have to add his eyebrows. That's the most standout feature on Bert the Beetle, is that he's got these great big expressive eyebrows. Just like that. And he's also got his little uh, fuzzy thing on the top of his head, his little fluff. So we're gonna add some fluff in. And again, if you have Hopefully you guys are all using a pencil and you can have an eraser and you can just fill that in a little bit right there. And of course right now he looks like he's had a horrible accident so we should probably give him some legs. Um, of which there are six, right? Because he's an insect. So I'm going to have his legs come down, the ones that help him stand. So he's, I sort of drew Bert so that he always had his bottom two legs were always kind of like how our legs work, right? So they, they support him. And then the top four were kind of like him having four arms. So I'm going to have him have one set of his top legs kind of on his hip here. So by doing that, what I do is I have one little line that comes out from his body. And then I connect it up, sort of make a little triangle. And then I give him the little bit at the end that kind of is uh, the last little bit of his leg, but it's also kind of like his hands. And then I'm going to have him be really excited to see you guys. So his top legs are just going to be lines that stick out from his body. One there. And one there. And then I'm going to give him, his, again, those little hands right there. He actually often has a little bit of fluff on his legs, especially when they're sticking to stuff. So I might add a little bit of fluff on the bottom legs, just a little bit. And of course, we mentioned in the story, right, he's got that awesome hairy body. So I think if you can, maybe we're going to add a little bit of fluff, give him a little fuzzy depth belly. And they actually are very furry creatures, which is, I think, another reason why I don't find them as scary as other creatures. Sorry, I, my computer blips sometimes. I think that's why I like bumblebees too. There's something about when an insect is just sort of furry. Caterpillars, bumblebees, adorable. So that's how you draw Bert. Pretty easy, right? And if you wanted to, you could have him saying something. I'm gonna have him say, hi, I'm Bert. But you can have him say whatever you want. So that's how I draw Bert. And hopefully you guys will have a chance to draw him or color him in. I'm going to move this down a little bit because I got a little tight at the top. But it's actually kind of amazing how simple it is to draw Bert the Beetle, which is very helpful for an illustrator like me when I have to draw a character about 60 times <laughs> or 100 times in a book. It's good to keep them nice and simple. So I hope your drawings of Bert turned out. If anybody ever has an opportunity to share them with me, I would love to see them uh, because I just love seeing how he turns out in everybody else's different styles. Oh, that, that, that was wonderful. I um, I can show mine right now. Yay! Oh, wait, wait, so where, where, where's the camera? There, there, there he is. <laughs> He's perfect. <laughs> awesome. And, I, and I, I hope students enjoyed that as well. Um, as Ashley said, this is being recorded. So if you'd like to go back and, and rewatch it, you you can and, and you know kind of pause and give students a give students a chance to catch up. Um, be we're we were at our time, unfortunately, Ashley. I can't believe it just flew by. I know we had tons of questions. Uh, before I'll come back to you and in, in one, one minute just to, to have a final a final word and a final goodbye. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to thank you, Ashley, again so much. I want to thank all of our listeners and our teachers. If you'd like to learn more about Canadian Geographic Education, our website is there on the, uh, on the screen, Cangio Education. 
Um, and if you'd like to learn more about Kids Can Press, their website is on the screen as well. They have some really wonderful books and they even have a classroom activities section as well, which is great. And if you'd like to learn more about Bert the Beetle, which comes out on June 1st, you can visit the Bert the Beetle page on the Kids Can Press website. And there's even a wonderful learning activity on there as well, where you can really extend what the kids have learned uh, from, from today's session. And um, Ashley, I'd like to bring you back in. If you'd like to say one final, final goodbye and a fi final message for our audience. I'm happy to. Well, first I wanna say thank you so much Canadian Geographic Education for having me and for arranging this event and for allowing me to connect with so many students across Canada today. This is just the most amazing way to connect with students and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and this platform. And I want to say, I know that there's loads of questions and I want to say that I'm available on social media. I'm Ashley Spires on Instagram teachers. So if you wanna find me there, I'm also available on my website, ashleyspires.com and you can email me questions. I I know there are a lot of burgeoning creators out there and maybe you have questions and I would love to answer them. So anything, anytime I'm available, find me. <laughs> and uh, thank you guys so much for listening to my story. I hope you guys get to read the end of Birth the Beetle and I hope you guys keep exploring and keep creating. Thanks so much, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, Ashley. Thank you to Kids Can Press, Can Geo Education, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, all of our teachers and students. Um, and again, you'll be able to find this recorded on our on our YouTube channel so you can watch it again and again. And I hope everybody has a wonderful day exploring insects, drawing insects and, and learn, learning lots and writing and drawing about it. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.